Hello, everyone. Welcome to News Now, the Belmont Journal's daily update on what's going on in the community of Belmont. I'm your host, Roger Colton. I have with me today Lori Slap, who is chair of the Belmont Warrant Committee. Lori, thanks for joining us. We want to talk about uh, the processes that are leading up to the proposed override uh, uh, this spring. Uh, before we really get start, when I say that you're chair of the Warrant Committee, what does that mean? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, the Warren Committee is really the financial advisors to town meetings. So we are a group that is appointed by the town moderator um, and look at all the budgets and any other issues of financial importance to the town. Now, the Warrant Committee has been working with the select board and the other financial leaders of the town to uh, develop a uh, an override budget and you're working on a non-override budget. Can can you tell us uh, the activities that you've been pursuing? Uh, certainly. Uh, the Financial Task Force 2 was appointed by the select board, and they were really the ones that have been driving the budget development and trying to develop a forecasting model that can look out for the next three years to determine what the size of an override would be if we wanted to keep the current level of services. Um, so what the Warren Committee wanted to do was to make sure that that information was all available to the public. So we've been making, uh, working hard with the town administrator and the school superintendent, the task force, as you said, the select board, trying to get these community forms where we can present the information and also gather input from the community. If cuts have to be made, for example, how um, residents would prioritize the services they receive and wanted to have an, an open dialogue. Now, it, you just said something that it is interesting. There is a collaboration, I heard you say, between the town side and the school side. I, I started out talking about the, the select board, but uh, to what extent do you work with both the, the schools and the town? Uh, I'd say we work with both of them equally. I mean, they're both uh, critical and critically important to the services that um, residents receive. So we really have to look at the town as a whole. Um, I think the school budget is larger. We sort of think there's often a 60-40 split in terms of the, the revenues and expenses. Um, when we have to make cuts, for example, that's the often the formula that's used. Um, but we know that all services are so valuable to the residents. We want to look at it in the totality. There are, it seem, would seem to me, two different aspects to presenting an override and to thinking about an override. One is the information that is presented to the community and one involves the information or the received from the community. Uh, let's talk about each of those. So how, how do you decide, given the complexity of uh, the issue, how do you decide what to tell the, the community and how? Um, what we wanted to explain was that, especially for a town like Belmont that has so little commercial development and relies so heavily on the tax property tax revenue, that with Proposition Two and a Half, it's really difficult to have uh, revenues keep keep up with expenses. Um, there are things like the we've had a tremendous enrollment, as you know. There's been over a thousand students added in the past twelve years. Pensions, healthcare, things increase more than two and a half percent. So we have to face this ongoing structural deficit. And what are the ways to address that? Um, one is through an override. There's also been a lot of uh, work to try to reduce expenses. And you know, we hear things like structural reform. How can we increase revenues? So we wanted to also explain to residents that there has been an awful lot of work in that area and it continues, but it still is not adequate to close the budget gap, if you will. Um, so often every, especially in towns like Belmont, uh, overrides are needed periodically if you want to retain the same level of services. And then people respond to you. The public uh, has its own ideas on what uh, can happen or what should happen. How does the public present that information and how do you take that into consideration? We've had a lot of uh, questions and comments at these forms. We've had three so far. There's another one coming up, up, up on the 11th, which is very helpful. I think for some who are just tuning in now that they know an override is going to be on the ballot, for example, they don't understand how the pension system might work, um, how, how the union contracts are negotiated. There are lots of 
questions that are um, unique to municipal government. Um, so we wanted to have questions that town department heads could answer and also wanted to set up, we have a, an online form um, on the, there's a page on the town website. So if people wanna submit questions or comments, and it's also very helpful to have people share their ideas about how things might be done differently. We're always looking for new ideas. I think there is this new structural um, improvement task force. Um, so I'm sure there are very good ideas out there as well that we would like to hear. So you would encourage that, that that's Absolutely. not an intrusion, you would encourage that. Absolutely, this is a problem we all have to face together. So yes, I would absolutely encourage it. So somebody uh, presents an idea to you, What? How, how is that idea vetted? I think we really turn to the experts. I mean, again, we're sort of a clearinghouse, as you will. We can answer those that we are familiar with in terms of the budget. But if it's a particular um, idea relating to a specific department, we would work with those department heads or pass that along, um, as I said, to see where they're the ones who really do the business day to day and have the best uh, view as to how, how realistic or how it might be implemented. You mentioned the the structural reform work group uh, or structural reform task force. Uh, what what does that mean? I think they're really again looking at are there any long term solutions. So I think they there has been work done in this area. Um, they're they're looking at really fundamental changes. So I think things that come up. And I have not been intimately uh, engaged with this group. But the examples are if there's any um, regionalization, uh, things come up with whether it be the in terms of public safety, for example. Um, I think there are um, real real changes that might change how some uh, departments look. Um, so, some of these ideas probably are viable and some are not, but it's very important to catalog all of them and explore them all. Um, and I think some of them sort of probably reemerge every decade or so, but things change. So it's certainly worth uh, looking at them once again. I want to go back for a minute. Uh, we talk about the override as though everyone knows what we mean by that. Can you uh, tell us uh, uh, what the proposed override is. The proposed override is six point four million dollars. Um, that would last uh, for three. Was according to the model would um, allow us to offer the same level of services with some some small enhancements. Basically, it's level services for the next three years. Um, so there is information that's come out from the uh, treasurer's office. If you want to go online again, I think it's about um, nine hundred dollars uh, for the average that home value, which is I think 1.3, $1.35 million. So again, we're trying to, if you go online, I'm sure, and, and certainly the campaigns will put out this information, how much that would mean per, you know, $100,000 of your home value. Um, but that's what's, uh, that's what's on the ballot. And it's also using some um, reserves. I think there was a lot of effort to try to keep it as low as possible and yet achieve this, achieve the goal of ke keeping services intact. And how do you scale the, the override? So why $6 million in change rather than $5 million in change or $8 million in change? And correspondingly, why three years and not five years or two years? How do you, what goes into deciding the scale? This was something that the financial task force that was established and has been working for the last 18 months developed a relatively sophisticated model that put in all the um, the, the revenue sources and the expenditures and came out with what the deficit would look like, um, but you know, the gap uh, between the revenues and, and um, recurring revenues and expenditures, and then determined what would be required to close that gap for three years. I think for five years, the worry was that it's just very difficult to uh, estimate accurately what the revenues might look like. Even things like state aid, where there's a, so much uncertainty, especially these COVID times, um, that it just became less reliable to go out for five years. Um, and you wouldn't want to either go on the high end and ask taxpayers to contribute more than is needed or the reverse, come up with a number that's smaller and then be facing cuts when you've you know, asked them to make this uh, sacrifice. And, and you just hit on an important issue. Uh, how, does, how have you taken COVID-19 into account in all of this? It's very difficult. I think you, you share that. I mean, one of the other things we've been trying to do through these forms is to share, be very transparent about the uncertainties that are there and how you try to do the best as possible to uh, mitigate the risk. But it certainly is 
is exists. Um, I think there's been a lot of Belmont has been very aggressive in going after the reimbursement that's available through the federal government. <clears throat> um, so I think that that way they've for in, in how they, it's affected the schools, for example, or some town departments and has received millions of dollars in reimbursement. Um, the question is, you don't really know if it, how it's affecting, for example, the restaurants and businesses in town, some of the local receipts. Um, so we do have reserves. There's some uh, stabilization. If, for example, we had unexpected costs, we know that we have this uh, reserve this pot of money available, sort of the, the rainy day fund in some ways, um, that if there were some emergencies, uh, we would be able to draw upon, but it certainly makes it very challenging. You mentioned a few minutes ago, the February 12th uh, forum. Can you again, tell us what that February 12th forum is? Uh, the 11th, actually, sorry about that. Or uh, the 11th. Thursday, the 11th. Um, this is the last one where we really wanted to um, explain what the no override budget looks like. And that is something that is being in, under development at the moment, both on the school and town side. Um, the town administrator and superintendent are working hard to give an idea of what would have to be cut if there is no override and we have to, um, Revenues come in lower, so we have to cut expenses. So we want to be able to uh, give residents a, a clear sense of what a yes or a no vote would mean. So um, give them a sense and also get some reaction to that as well. If someone wanted to participate in that, what would they do? If they go, we hope to get the information out through different listservs, but they could go on the town website and there'll be a Zoom information about how to join the meeting. Um, and then we certainly will present the information that we're given about the no override budget, but we do hope to have at least an hour or so at least half the meeting for community input. Um, so if they come on the Zoom call, there is plenty of opportunity to, to raise their Zoom hands and away we go. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us, Lori. Thank you very much, Roger. Lori Slapp, the chair of the Belmont Warrant Committee, the financial advising committee to town meeting. You've been watching News Now, the Belmont Journal's daily update on what's going on in the community of Belmont. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Roger Colton. I'll talk with you again next time.